and see what happens. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to switch back to Ricardo. All right. Um, it looks like we're live. Okay, so Shelby's picking up the screen. The screen. All right, so we are live. We are here with uh, Tubdual Leboic. Hi, me. me. Okay, and uh, Ricardo De Salvo. Um, Tubdual, he's a physics professor at the University of Utah. Um, he is an associate professor, and he's been there for what uh, seventeen years. Seventeen years. Seven years. Fairly long time. Um, currently, he is working on a few different things. Uh, his involvement with LIGO is he's helping to develop some uh, new mirrors. Is that right? That's correct. Correct. Yes. yes. Maybe we're going to do that. Um, okay. And then uh, Ricardo, he is he's been working in gravitational wave development um, for thirty years. Um, almost. almost 30 years and uh, currently he is helping to uh, develop new mirror systems for LIGO but he's worked on a whole bunch of other things if he wants to go into all of those he's welcome to do that but um, he is a lead scientist on uh, LIGO and Virgo and some other um, involvements with those um, you also do a little bit of teaching still okay. 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 Occasional okay, teaching. Occasional. Right. I'm I'm <laughs> and I'm Paul Ricketts. I work at the University of Utah Physics and Astronomy Department also. Um, but we'll be talking more about what they're doing. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, I guess where we want to start is um, maybe we want to talk about uh, what gravitational waves are firstly let me check something really quick all right so um, all right so let's do an intro to explain what gravity and gravitational waves are first um, and uh, Ricardo brought up a good point to start with is um, gravity as we know it, as everybody is taught in schools these days and previously, is kind of not true. So <laughs> you, uh, either of you want to expand on the untruth of gravity as we kind of understand it publicly? Want to you should go ahead. You should, you should explain, explain that there is no gravity. Of course, there is no gravitational force. True, true. Uh, that is, that is uh, 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 let's uh, start from uh, taking a car ride. ride. Uh, um, when you, when you accelerate the car, car uh, uh, it applies a force to you and accelerates you forward. So, so how do you, you feel, feel it? it uh, uh, wow. I feel, I feel like, like there is gravitation pulling me backward. backward. Well, well there is a force, force that, that is pulls you forward, forward and, you and you feel on your, your shoulder, shoulder um, and, and the seat push you forward. forward. And when, and when it breaks, uh, uh, that you have, have to decelerate, there is a force that is. Uh, uh, applied, applied by the restraining belt. So when, so when you're sitting on your chair, chair what, do you, what do you feel? Hey Ricardo, hold on one second. Um, you have an echo, so you need to mute one of your your um, your screens. Oh, I, uh, it may come from, 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 uh, from uh, elsewhere, but I only I, 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 I only have one. one. I don't okay. hear you. I don't hear you. Yeah. yeah. So it may, so it be, may on be on your side. side. Um, hmm. So, in, so any case, in any case, 
uh, when you sit on your chair, what you, what you feel, feel is, is, is all you feel, feel is the thoughts that push your, your uh, back, back up, up exactly as when you accelerate, that is acceleration in the car, car uh, you, you feel, feel the pressure on your back. So when there is no force uh, gravitational, all you feel is the force that chemistry of your chair makes uh, uh, to, to accelerate you up again and null the acceleration of gravity. And the acceleration of gravity is due to the warp of space time and uh, due to the presence of Earth. That is the center of, uh, of uh, relativity. I make you another example. If you are uh, on uh, the in the shuttle or in the uh, 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 sta station, um, what's the name? Uh, space space station there. Um, you know, yeah, you are floating inside there. How much uh, is there any force on you? You know that there is no force on you because you don't feel any pressure on any direction. And uh, and then is what is happening is you are just in free fall, you're actually falling forward, but because you have a velocity, as you fall forward, you also move, uh, fall down, you also move forward. And, and so it's an eternal falling towards the center. Um, that is uh, where there is the, cent the, the center of uh, warping of the space around Earth due to Earth mass. So that is the 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 core the most important part of uh, general relativity and once you talk about warp in space time um you can uh, also uh transmit to waves on on this uh, space time the same way that you warp it Do people see the screen uh, over there? I can see it. So, uh, I mean, I know that the two of you do see. So what's happening is uh, uh, when you have two heavy body back there and they are uh, uh, orbiting each other, uh, at some point they are up, down, and some point they are right, left. And, uh, and so the warping, that uh, cause them to accelerate toward each other. Of course, they are orbiting just like on the on the on the space shuttle or the space station. Um, uh, and so they are continuously falling toward it, each other, and in, and in doing that, they both are attracted by the warping of the other body, but they also change the warping of space time around them, and and then they transmit. Uh, this warping, they radiate this warping at the speed of light uh, all around. And uh, when uh, you see the image here, you see the dots are uh, are uh, uh, up. Uh, uh, the, the ellipse is uh, up, uh, means that the two stars uh, in that moment, they are ri uh, right left. And when the, the ellipse is horizontal, means that the stars are upside down. And that means an upside down can happen with one above and two below or with two above and one below. And so the gravitational wave actually has the, the uh, double frequency of uh, what is the orbit of all stars. And if we can read the gravitational waves, we can actually transduce, it's a transducer like uh, the tip of uh, one of the old uh, uh, phonograph. Uh, uh, we can translate, uh, uh, transduce the orbit of the stars or the black holes or neutron star or whatever it is that emits the gravitational waves and then reconstruct it into our lab. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> but yes, but uh, if you take uh, uh, well, first thing, uh, uh, the emission of gravitational waves goes with uh, uh, c to the third power or fourth power to the speed b beta. So the, uh, the velocity divided by c to the third or fourth power. So that is a very small number. And then it is proportional to big G, which is a very small number. And so the gravitational waves uh, have amplitude that are minimal. So uh, let's imagine that we have two neutron stars. So each of them is one and a half solar masses. And they rotate at the speed of light at uh, over an orbit of uh, uh, 20 kilometers. Uh, so we have these two stars, they uh, orbit on an orbit of 20 kilometers, a speed of light, and they oscillate about one or two kilohertz. And uh, the strain that you see here on uh, of space time as it, as it arrives to Earth, and I'm talking about a close by neutron star, something like 10, 20 mega parsec away, so it's not, not far. So the, the strain that we we'll get here would be 10 to minus 23, uh, uh, 21. Okay, sorry, I was exaggerating. Uh, and strain of 10 to minus 21 means that if I make an, a, a detector, which, uh, which is a kilometer long, it will stretch, uh, a kilometer is uh, 10 to the three meter, and uh, times 10 to the 21 makes 10 to minus 18 meters, uh, which, you know, sort of small to measure, especially if you are to measuring it across an arm, which is a kilometer long. Yeah, that is exactly why uh, this guy here uh, said uh, that, uh, yes, they exist, they came out of gravitation uh, of, a, of a general relativity, but we would never be able to measure it. And, uh, and if you want to, <clears throat> and uh, you, you may ask uh, the question, was Einstein stupid? And then let me tell you why he was not really stupid. Although he had some handicap, but he was not stupid back then we did not have super stabilized laser that, that produce megawatts of coherent flight that are needed to measure 10 to minus 18 meters at one kilohertz. So that's interesting. It was, so you say, oh, well, at the time only at the, uh, at the best was fluorescence or arc light, uh, arc uh, lamp. And the next thing, they did not have a dielectric mirror coating, the one that uh, Stuart Dual and I are working on that can sustain a megawatt of laser light uh, 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 in reflection. Uh, think about uh, if you were to put a megawatt of light power on your buff, uh, bathroom mirror, that would just blow up in your face in, uh, in, uh, in a plasma. You don't, really, don't try that home. And then the cosmic isolation did not exist, the ground, moves naturally 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 6 meter in quiescent case, not during an earthquake. During an earthquake, they can move a meter. Uh, but uh, during quiescent time, they move a fraction of a micron continuously. And, uh, and uh, the gravitational wave is 10 to minus 18 meters, which is a million, million times smaller than the natural movement of soil. So this one did not exist back then. That is actually what I did design for Virgo, Tama, Tagura, and, uh, uh, and so I designed all of this seismic isolation before I, put, uh, I went uh, to, to mirrors. And then uh, they were not uh, 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 ultra high vacuum. We need to make kilometers and kilometers of uh, ultra high vacuum, 10 to minus nine Tor, and the controls to keep these mirrors in lock, they did not exist, but above everything, Einstein had a big handicap. He was only a theorist. 
Yeah, we're gonna live to talk to all and then in time I go get a beer. <laughs> um, you're asking about the number of times uh, people attempt to detect them? So the, the, thing that I, uh, that the one thing that I know is that the first attempts were using uh, bars, metallic bars, and the idea was to uh, use these bars as springs that would uh, oscillate. Uh, and the uh, oscillation of these springs would be excited by gravitational waves. And that was taking place in the 60s, 60s, 70s. And that, that did not, that did not uh, yield any uh, signal. The frequency at which they were working was higher than uh, the gravitational waves that were eventually uh, detected by LIGO in uh, 2015. That's the one attempt that I know, but I've been in this uh, business only uh, for a couple of years. So I'm sure that Ricardo knows much more about the history of uh, attempted detection of gravitational waves. Right, but that's that's not a direct detection. That's uh, so there was this uh, there is this uh, system of uh, two pulsars, and from so it's a pair of uh, it's a binary it's a pair of pulsars that are orbiting each other, and the pulse signal is received from both of the pulsars. So you can you can make a very precise measurement of the uh, orbit, and you can make a very precise measurement of the evolution of the orbit of this pair of uh, stars. And so if for some reason there is energy that is lost by the, oh, you have a slide about that. Uh, if there is energy that is lost by the, by the system, the parameters of the orbit is gonna change with time. And if this energy is lost due to the, at the time, math mathematically existing gravitational wave, then you can calculate what is the expected rate at which energy is being lost by the system. And it just happened. So that's, that's the graph that uh, Ricardo is showing right now as a function of time, the change in the period of the system, which, which is related to the energy that is stored in the system. And uh, this is not a fit, it, this is an actual calculation. Well, uh, first thing you should say that these one are two pulsars that uh, happen to be pointing toward Earth, and so we can detect one is very strong and they are, the other one is very weak, and they are both pulsars, and we can measure exactly their orbital parameter, and from that they are masses and uh, everything connected to this. Yeah, and and uh, and they process a little bit, and in fact, I think the 1915, uh, uh, within uh, something like 30 years or so, will be pointing elsewhere, and we will not be able to to detect it anymore. Now, there are other attempts that so using pulsars, there are other attempts that have been uh, made. Uh, if you think of a single pulsar, not in a binary system. Uh, that is uh, at some distance uh, from us. If you have a gravitational wave that uh, travels uh, transversally between us and the pulsar, it's gonna affect the timing of the pulses that are received from this pulsar. And so that could be, so that would be more of a detection 
of a gravitational wave directly, more than in the case of these uh, 1915 pairs of uh, cultures that were uh, losing energy by mean of uh, emitting gravitational waves. Um, so, so if you have a pulse signal coming from a star uh, that is detected, if you monitor the precise timing of these pulses, you could, you could observe a modulation in the times of the pulses that would uh, betray the presence of a gravitational wave in the line of sight. Uh, uh, I don't know how long people have been trying to do this, but I've not heard of any uh, successful detection. And it's raining outside and I need to get my uh, dog inside. So I'm gonna do that. So we actually, people have been uh, trying and they're getting closer and closer to what we think is uh, uh, threshold, uh, uh, detection threshold sensitivity. In fact, uh, we were a little bit afraid that they may arrive before us. Of course, they would have detected gravitational waves of super long uh, wavelength because they have to be comparable with the distance of uh, between us and, uh, and uh, the, the neutron star that is uh, typically the, the pulsars are inside our galaxy. So we have tens or uh, thousand uh, light years, a thousand light years away. And, uh, and uh, so, and they would then detect uh, the gravitational waves from the orbit of supermassive black holes when two gal galaxies somewhere in the universe are about to merge. So that is what they uh, would detect. So it's not the same that we are detecting. We are detecting neutron stars and smallish, uh, smallish black hole means below 200 solar masses. Now in this, uh, let me add a little bit detail so these two stars were orbiting each other in seven, in about eight hours in 1975, and they measured from the mass uh, and uh, the orbital period, they calculated how much uh, uh, energy uh, would be radiated in gravitational waves and therefore the acceleration of the orbital speed. And that calculation is uh, this uh, line here, we draw through here. So this is the calculation from the orbital parameters. This is 7.75 .7 hours and uh, 1.4 solar masses each. And uh, uh, then what they did, because they could measure these, uh, um, uh, uh, these uh, pulsars timing very well, they figured out that, uh, uh, they that the orbit was actually accelerating and they measured it over something like uh, 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 75 to 90 for 15 years, Hals and Taylor. Uh, and, uh, and they found uh, that uh, they, these measurements were falling just above the calculated acceleration of the orbital speed. Then over here, they stopped measuring because they got a Nobel Prize and they didn't, didn't give it down anymore. And somebody else measured later down there. These lines fall into onto the, the predicted uh, curve from emission gravitational waves within a precision one part of 10 to the four. Uh, so that's pretty good. And uh, these two stars will merge in about 300 million years from now. So the, the very soon. Very soon. Okay, so now that we talked about those, um, can you talk about where LIGO started to step in and how um, how how there's a little bit of a, a, a difference into and talk a, a little bit about LIGO and how it kind of came around. Uh, um, LIGO came around, uh, well, Weber is the guy that invented the bars for uh, detecting gravitational waves that then became cryo, et cetera. But then uh, he also got the idea that uh, if you really, the bars would only detect the, the in spiral of, uh, of a black hole, uh, uh, sorry, of neutron stars, only at the very end when they, they oscillate around a kilohertz. Uh, but he also figured out that this uh, stra strain of space time could uh, e easily be measured with uh, uh, or best be measured 
with um, um, a, a Michelson interferometer. And, um, and he suggested that to forward and, uh, and the forward uh, uh, that uh, was, uh, was working at a huge research lab here in California actually built a small uh, uh, Michelson interferometer that uh, he said, well, there is no gravitational wave uh, generated uh, uh, from Alpha Centauri or something like that because it was very little and low, uh, low sensitivity. But the concept was there. And, uh, and then uh, people started calculating uh, how much uh, precision it would take. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, once you understand that, you understand that the Michelson alone is not enough. And uh, you have to add much more to it. And uh, you have to, to build essentially a, a, an interferometer which contains inside the, um, uh, uh, let's see, get, uh, in, uh, that uh, contains uh, inside, oh uh, uh, yeah, that is what I wanted to show you, not that. Um, so to increase the sensitivity, you have uh, to put uh, uh, inside the arms of Michelson a Fabri Perot to uh, store the light here um, longer. Uh, so if you have a finesse of thousand, means that the light go back and forth thousand times in average before it comes out. And you put some, uh, and this one increase your sensitivity to the movement of this ten test mass by a uh, by, uh, thousand times. And then uh, you can put the power recycling and, uh, and uh, lots of other tricks that we can, I can spend the, the entire hour discussing this, but this is what uh, gave us the optical sensitivity to the distance to get uh, the, the, uh, the measurement. And this one we need uh, to, uh, to, to thank uh, uh, Ron River that I show here, which to me is the real hero, the biggest hero uh, that, uh, that allowed us to, to, to detect gravitational waves with uh, what invented the Fabri Perot and recycling mirror and everything. Um, yeah. Great, so I think that kind of gets us into, into where we are to ask uh, how kind of LIGO works. Um, can you, can you explain kind of just in a basic way about what is going on to make what you just talked about? How does that work um, to give us the results? I know it's I know it's super complicated, but yeah. yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, this one is uh, more or less at some stage that was uh, in uh, observation round two. Now we are we have just finished observation round three. And observation round two, we only had 100 kilowatts on these mirrors because it takes time. And uh, this one is uh, the Fabri Perot, uh, invented by Ron River, that uh, traps the light here and creates the sensitivity by 1,000. And then this one is the Fabri Perot, uh, the Michelson, which is in a dark mode. That means that out here, you only have 85 milliwatts, while here you have a kilowatt, so one part per million. It goes out in the signal mode. Most of this goes back, it gets trapped in, and then it's all optics here. The trick is that you have to take these four masses here and you have to suspend them from fibers. So their uh, motion above 10 hertz is uh, below 10 to minus 18 meters. And to do that, uh, you have to suspend them. Uh, um, uh, from, uh, um, what's this, uh, I have to find the, the thing here. Uh, you have to suspend them from seismic isolation towers, uh, like this. So this one is a seismic isolation of, uh, of, uh, Virgo, which I did design, uh, now almost 30 years ago. Uh, this one were invented by um, 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 Alberto Giazzotto, uh, but um, he was very smart, but he did not know mechanics enough to make it work properly. 
So I, I, uh, we had lots of fights with him because uh, he thought he knew everything and he knew a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it's also, it was always a fight with great respect because he's a great, he was a great brain, but uh, the mechanics I had to push back and say, no, no, I make the mechanics, you let me work. And if you make these filters, these are mechanical filters um, uh, that uh, each of them attenuate a few hundred. So if this one attenuates a 300 and this one is a 300, the total attenuation is 100,000. And then this one is uh, uh, whatever, this is another 100,000. And then if you mu multiply those together with this filter, et cetera, you get a million, million attenuation that makes that uh, you get all of these attenuation here is 10 to the 15th at 10 hertz of attenuation. And, uh, and that one, this is what we built back then, okay? And uh, if you want to see what uh, those filters look like, uh, these one are some of these more, much more modern filters here. And uh, uh, um, that uh, they are made uh, uh, with a uh, very high quality steel and uh, each of these filter holds a few hundred kilograms. I like to show these photos because uh, you see my, my wife did not dress up in white to get married with me, but then he got uh, dressed up in white to build this thing. That's great. Um, okay, so when you are talking about can you go back to the the diagram for uh, your lego of the mirrors and stuff yeah yes yes uh, yes yeah. yes yes so um basically what we're looking at is there's a uh very high power laser that shines through uh, the blue things on here. Those are mirrors, but they can allow light to go through the, the back of them. Or is there like a, a hole or something inside of there to allow it to go through? Uh, 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 no, they are, uh, they are, uh, so, um, uh, I don't know how much you know about uh, uh, interferometry and, uh, and uh, Fabri-Ferro, but for example, this mirror here is a six nine mirror. That means that, uh, uh, it reflects 99.9999% of, uh, of the light. This one here is a 3.9 mirror. It's 99.9% .9 of the light. And uh, so if I put light here, because this one reflects 99.9, .9, the light will go back and forth a uh, uh, thousand times. Uh, but then it will all come out from this side. However, if I come with... Uh, uh, some light here, and I adjust the phase of the light that comes in here, I can actually, uh, uh, well, uh, if you don't ex uh, adjust the phase, this light will actually come out, uh, because this one is a mirror 99.9, .9, so only one per thousand of that light will go in. But if you adjust the phase of the light that come in with the phase of the light that is trapped inside here precisely, you can actually cancel the reflection light of this beam. And so all the light will go in. And in order to do this, you have to hold this mirror exactly at the resonant position within 10 to minus 12 meter. So you have to suspend them so that they are quieter than 10 to minus 18 meters but you have to keep them at distance from here to there exactly at resonance within 10 to minus 12 meter. And then all of these beam, it will be a kilowatt, will just go inside here and go back and forth and be bottled up to a megawatt. And then at the end, after thousand of uh, oscillation, there will be another uh, beam coming out, will be, again, will be about a kilowatt and will come out. And you have the same on this side, and here you cancel them so that down here you only have 100 milliwatt uh, powerful laser pointer and most of the light will go back to the laser and if you allow a kilowatt go on the back of a, a few kilowatt to go on, the, on back on the laser you wreck it because it just blow up for heating and so you put another mirror here with a, a reflectivity of maybe two nines 99 percent 
And so you play the same trick and you bottle all the return light inside with this light that comes in just by inter interference. And this is a way that with 200 watt laser, you can actually keep inside there one megawatt of standing power, which is necessary if you want to measure 10 to minus 18 meters uh, at one kilohertz. So just for the public's sake, um, yeah. can you give us an idea of how small 10 to the negative 18 is? Oh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Like, yes. I, I hear a lot of um, comparisons to the width of a proton. Can you kind of uh, yeah. yes. give them an idea? Uh, 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 you know, one meter is 40 inches. And uh, it's about uh, a little bit more than half uh, my height. I, I'm 1.8. And, uh, and uh, uh, if I get the thickness of a human hair, it's about 100 micron, 80, 70 micron, depending if it is a baby or if it is uh, uh, different hairs of different diameters, but they're all about 100 microns. So it takes uh, already 10,000 hairs, one on top of the other, to make half my height. Now, I look at the hair, and I look at uh, uh, with the wavelength of actually it's half a micron, what I use, but I make it, I round it out to one micron. And this wavelength is 100 times smaller than the hair that I can barely see. I uh, go up a couple of meters, so I don't see it anymore because it's diffraction limited. And this, uh, this uh, light, uh, one micron, is equal to uh, the, the thickness of 10,000 atoms. So I can put a line of 10,000 atoms along here. And that one is the atomic diameter is the order of 10 to minus 10 meter. And then if I look inside, at the bottom of the atom, I find this nucleus, which is 100,000 times smaller than the atom. The atom, as you know, is essentially empty. And that's 10 to minus 15 meters. And what we need to measure is 10 to minus 18 meter. Now we are 10 to minus 19 with, uh, with the advanced the Virgo and LIGO. And 10 to minus 18 meter is one per thousand of the size of a nucleon. And at, you know, it's small. And uh, to, get, uh, to, to explain why, uh, uh, Einstein was, was per, per, uh, perplexed. I mean, the seismic motion is of the order of the micron, which is a million, million times larger than the gravitational wave that we want to measure over a kilometer. So these, uh, these uh, seismic attenuators that you have seen in the photos, each attenuate now more than a thousand. And, uh, and by the way, they have to have no spring quakes inside to the level of 10 to minus 18 meter, which is not obvious. Also, there's another little problem that uh, Tugdual and I are working on, and is the thermal noise of the mirror. Uh, so when the light reflects on the electrons of the mirror, and the mirror, uh, the electrons are bound, roughly bound to the atom, so they are, uh, the oscillation of those electrons is less than an atom, uh, but uh, not much less, maybe 10 times less. Uh, the thermal motion is large, which is millions and millions times larger than gravitational waves. And you may say, but you're crazy. How can you measure that? But we have a good friend. And the good friend is called Avogadro. And he gave us a big number to play with. So if we average a reflection of uh, uh, billions and billions of electrons, as uh, Sagan would say, then we can push it down to uh, push down the thermal uh, uh, noise of these electrons. However, and the Avogadro actually would allow us to win big time. The problem is that there is then coherent motion of these electrons, which are called like the modes of a mirror. And that is uh, connected with a dissipation in the coatings. And that is what uh, Tugdual and I are working on. Awesome. So basically, uh, you have a lot of things in your way to be able to 
get that out of, or to, to be able to see the signal. So the DC has to do with the fact that 10 to the minus 18 meters is traveled by at the speed of light in a very short time. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, pretty, that's pretty, pretty cool. Cool. because, that, because yeah. that, that is what is being measured, and that should not have been possible. But, but people like Ricardo, because I was not involved, they made it possible, and it's it's just an amazing, amazing, amazing achievement. Let me let me tell you uh, uh, something that will make you laugh, and uh, because we actually had the common mentor that uh, go put me and took dwelling in. Uh, in, uh, in uh, contact, and he actually believed it was possible, and managed to funnel the money into into this, at least in Europe. Um, that the name is Patrick Fleury. But um, I was his friend when both Patrick and I were in uh, uh, high energy physics and cosmic rays, and uh, then I moved to Italy. And uh, because my wife asked me, <laughs> wanted to, to teach Italian to our children, we are both Italian, so we went back to Italy, and I got to Pisa. And then I went to the director, and the director told me, uh, uh, what, asked him, what do you want me to do? And he said, oh, if you want to help those people, they are desperate. So I went there, and I thought, uh, that's totally crazy. It will never work. But... Uh, I had been uh, for already 15 years a fairly successful uh, uh, nuclear and energy physics scientist. I say, okay, hey, after all of these uh, nice things that I've done, I can go for a great failure. And uh, it's a little bit, I felt like Don Quixote. And uh, so I went there thinking it was going to be my great failure in life. And then I failed failing because eventually it worked. But it took only 25 years. So, so in the same period that uh, Ricardo referred to, uh, I was a student then. I was a PhD student at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And I remember professors, like physics professors, right, in a great school in France, advising students not to work on gravitational wave detectors because it was not going to work ever. That, that's how it was regarded. It was regarded, it was regarded as something impossible. Of course, of it course. was impossible. That's why we made it. <laughs> so I guess uh, you guys are great at putting people to uh, making things work that are not supposed to work. Uh, okay, so <laughs> um, let's let's move on to uh, another question. So um, here's one that should be. Previous should be easy, I guess. Uh, do longer baselines for the laser systems increase the ease of detection? Um, how does it help, and is it more difficult to use? More difficult, yes. Uh, let me find uh, if I find it. Yeah, I, I have uh, something like 200 biographs here. I'm moving around, and uh, uh, yeah, that is probably correct. Okay. Um, this is a noise budget of uh, uh, any of these. This is probably LIGO. And uh, that one is in strain, advanced LIGO. Uh, and uh, so this we know we, before we needed to make 20 minus 21 in sensitivity to detect anything. Now we are talking about 10 to minus 23, which is not too bad. We improved a little bit. So, so the, the strain is by how much the length changes divided by the length itself, right? Yes. So if you get a, a neutron star in spiral, it starts at low frequency with a certain qu actually quite high uh, signal to noise here, a quite high amplitude, let's say 10 to minus 22, and then it comes down this way, uh, and uh, and then uh, at some point about here, at uh, at a couple of thousand uh, kilo, a couple of thousand hertz, a couple of kilohertz, uh, they will in spiral, uh, they will uh, plunge into each other and form a black hole. So they essentially start here at uh, 10 hertz uh, to be visible and then uh, they keep coming down and and then they plunge uh, here so from uh, here 
uh, from here from 30 hertz to plunge it takes about one minute just to give you an idea and uh, it took uh, millions and millions of years to get here of course uh, from over here it takes maybe 10 minutes and uh, from over here it takes something you know uh, uh, it's just a straight line now uh, what we have here you see a lot of noises here so that is the residual seismic noise because it was only attenuated a million million times of course we could attenuate some more and push this brown line that way but this one is the noise of the surface okay and uh, then you have uh, the coating brownian noise which is also a movement of the surface here and then the others are uh, suspension thermal noise is also a movement of a pendulum that suspend the, the mirror. So these ones are all movements of the surface. So the brown, the, 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 the blue and the, oh, sorry, and the red are movement of a surface. And uh, if I want to measure uh, a strain of 10 to minus 23, if I take that noise, surface noise and divided by a longer distance, I get a ten, uh, I get more sensitivity. So if instead of four kilometers, I go to 40 kilometers with the same elements, then I bring this line down a factor of 10. And so instead of being sensitive to 10 to minus 23 strain, I become sensitive to 10 to minus 24 strain. And that means that uh, I can go 10 times farther in the universe, which is start getting close to the end of the universe. So uh, it, it helps because if we push down this sensitivity here, uh, then uh, we, we can improve that. Uh, incidentally, the red line uh, is a coating brown, Brownian noise that uh, Turdual and I are uh, trying to fight against. And, uh, and then maybe we'll succeed. Who knows? Okay, cool. So um, we've had a, a question which we can answer with this other kind of uh, question that we already had. So um, what was the main advance that had to happen for, adla for advan advanced LIGO um, to take place to be able to uh, detect gravitational waves? Were they detected, and where did they came? Where did they come from? Okay, main. Uh, there's not only one. Okay, so from uh, uh, LIGO to advanced LIGO, uh, the power went from tens of kilowatts to few hundreds of kilowatts. That makes that here we gain about a factor of three on this side. This is the shot noise limit. So if I increase the power you go down a factor of three here, which is substantial. Uh, and uh, in, uh, um, in here, thermal noise, it was still far away. It's something that we are hitting now, but it was not a limit at that time. The part of the limit was given by the, uh, the, uh, the, the violet, so that was a quantum noise, and this one can be tuned in different ways. Uh, the biggest problem were the suspension thermal noise and uh, somewhat the seismic noise and the suspension thermal noise and the control noise that you don't see here, we are cutting off right here. And uh, so these, uh, there were some other noises in this part here that have, what called technical noises that have been pushed down. So here there was a factor of almost 10 increase in this direction by increasing the laser power and by imp uh, adding uh, the output uh, more cleaner and uh, lots of uh, optical things. And uh, the suspension thermal noise was pushed from about here to down there. And the seismic that before was actually closing here in normal LIGO to advanced LIGO, it was pushed down there by a factor of 50. Advanced li uh, original LIGO was cutting at 50 hertz about here. And um, um, 
And uh, to bring down the suspension thermal noise where it is, we had to go from steel wire to fused silica quartz fiber suspensions because steel has uh, a lot of thermal noise and uh, fused silica is a much better uh, elastic material with less losses and less uh, suspension thermal noise. So uh, roughly everything was improved from Virgo to of all of these uh, uh, noise sources from uh, Virgo and LIGO to advance at Virgo and LIGO. So after you made all of those advancements, were you able to finally detect something? Actually, uh, it actually happened uh, just before uh, um, uh, we actually started the run, and it was interesting. Let me just, uh, while I go there, these one are the, the four, uh, the three plus one sites. This one is uh, LIGO Hanford, which uh, this one is Rattlesnake Mountain for some reason. Um, this one is LIGO Livingstone, and uh, this arm was a little bit lower. This one is a swamp in Louisiana. So to bring this arm in level to that there, to dig out the dirt from here and build a berm there, and then this thing is filled up with uh, water and then alligators and alligator like sciences very much. And that is a problem. But in any case, this one is uh, 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 LIGO Livingstone. This one is Virgo. That's where I started. Uh, and I designed the seismic for this. And so this is my university. This is a leaning tower over here. And uh, that's where everything started uh, by dropping balls from the tower. You remember that. Uh, so that is it. Um, so your question was, and now let me go over to, to selecting images here. Uh, how do I get there? Yes. Um, so what your question is there? Oh, event. Now I have to look for a long time. Um, uh, to, 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 to. What well, Ricardo is looking for the slides, I noticed that there is someone who is asking how do we uh, establish the direction from which gravitational waves uh, are moved. Okay, let me go back uh, here. So it is on my way there, and uh, that's timing. Exactly. You see, uh, so gravitational waves come from some direction, and if I have at least a three direction, three detectors, and I can uh, time the uh, signals within uh, microseconds or less, uh, then I, and the more precisely I time, uh, the more precisely I point up to the sky someplace. And uh, that's why we have uh, Virgo and LIGO working together when you hope to get more in the future. So it's so, Yeah. It is stereo, it's just the same way it works, right? It's exactly the same reason why you have uh, your ears at the opposite ends of your head, because you make a time delay uh, to figure out from which side uh, the, the saber-suited uh, tiger is coming, and so you know which side to run away, and that's how your, uh, your uh, forefathers survived. Um, so that is fine. So what happened is uh, uh, we got, uh, um, we were just, uh, the system was already in science mode, uh, but it was not a clear science mode. It was only one hour or two between uh, the engineering mode in which uh, the engineers are uh, tuning up the interferometer and they were just about uh, to trigger the event into science mode and we got an interesting event. And we never expected because we designed the instruments to detect the neutron star in spiral and instead we got this massive black hole that uh, did hit us like a hammer. Now, what you see here, it's the actual event. So from the actual event, we reconstructed, I told you we, we, we have built a transducer of orbital uh, uh, movement. So uh, what we did, we took the, oh, the reconstructed orbit of these two black holes, and then uh, somebody was smart enough to calculate the 
gravitational lenses of these uh, black holes. And then uh, uh, they took uh, a photo from uh, uh, the space telescope and uh, look in, uh, and then they calculated how the background of galaxies would be changing uh, if you were a few light year away looking up in, uh, in, that, uh, in that direction. Of course, if you had been living in that place, in that direction, you would have seen the stars uh, uh, moving around for, uh, for centuries or thousands of years because this black hole took uh, uh, literally billions of years to get to this event here. So what we saw, uh, well, we measured this was September 14, 2015. And uh, what we got is a 36 solar mass black hole uh, and, uh, and a 29 solar masses black holes to merge. And, uh, and if you add these two numbers, you get 65. But what we found is that the final black hole that I tell you later how to determine these masses if there is time. And so there are three missing solar masses, which is the radiated power that was radiated by these two black holes during the event, which lasted 0 0.2 seconds. And it takes time to digest this because the sun emits about 1% of its mass in thermal energy in about 10 billion years. That's the lifetime of the sun. And 1% is the change for, of weight from uh, hydrogen to helium. 1% in 10 billion years uh, of a solar mass here is three solar masses in 0 0.2 seconds flat. It was a heck of a crash. Uh, you're lucky you were at, uh, at 1.3 gigalight year ago. That's why it's easy to detect, huh? Uh, that's why it is easy to detect. We never expected these big things to fall into each other that often. We never suspected. So this was, by the way, this means that these two guys crashed on each other, not when the dinosaurs were around. They fell onto each other when uh, the Amede were starting differentiating at the bottom of the sea, okay? Uh, uh, the uh, solar system is about 5 billion year old, Earth is maybe 4 billion year old, and then it took time to stabilize enough and build the moon and all of that. And then eventually life started coming out about at this time, and these two guys crashed in they enter into the detection range, which was uh, at the time about 30 Hertz um, at, uh, at this time, at time 0 0.25, and it oscillated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, ten times. And then they merged. In that time, they went from 0.3 speed of light to 0.6 speed of light. It accelerates better than a Ferrari. And, uh, and then uh, the distance went from uh, four, ra five radii to contact. And all of this happened in 0 0.2 seconds. Of course, they have been orbiting before for millions of years, but we couldn't detect it because our sensitivity started at 30 hertz at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and this and one, this if you want to see, is uh, the uh, the signal detected in Washington, this one, the signal detected in Livingston. Virgo at the time was not finished yet, and so it didn't detect anything. This one is the um, uh, general relativity signals that if you subtract that from, the sig from a signal, that is what is left, and essentially there is uh, almost nothing left here. And you can see that it started about at 30 hertz, and it came up. And after uh, 0.1 second, it was already at uh, 50 hertz. And then uh, uh, it, uh, after 0.15, it was at 60 hertz. And then it went up like whoop. And uh, I can uh, uh, put this on loudspeaker. I hope you hear it over there.
I don't know if the people uh, uh, can hear this. Do I get any feedback? Yeah, I, we could we can hear it. So what you hear is two different uh, a low noise a rumble, very low frequency rumble. That is actual voice of interferometer, and it actually just means whoop whoop at the end because uh, it stopped at 250 hertz. This is the beginning of uh, where you can hear. And, uh, and so what we did, we took the Fourier transform, we multiplied by 1,000 and played back. And that is when you hear the whip, whip. Uh, so it is uh, essentially accelerated, uh, multiplied in frequency by 1,000 so you can hear. And I'll let you hear the white noise of interferometer first and then the whip or boop. So that was our first uh, event. And uh, uh, first, uh, you may think, uh, uh, are we sure it's a real event? And uh, so this is how we were sure of that with the first, that first event that uh, it was a real event because uh, this one here is, a, uh, is a, the noise of an interferometer, how often it will make something with that frequency. And uh, this black one is, and, and this is done by shifting in time, so destroying the coherence between the two uh, interferometers. And, uh, and uh, down here is the event, so it is at many orders of magnitude outside. In addition to that, so the First event, I said, oh, well, we are sure it is a gravitational event. It's not bullshit that we send it out. But in addition to that, uh, we also got already in O1 and O2 something like event, uh, 11 events, and uh, each of them with its own voice, each of them with its own signal to noise, each of them with uh, its own everything. But we were lucky that the first one was the hammer in our head. It was just uh, 63 or 65 solar masses crashing together at a reasonably uh, short distance. This one is also equally as big, but instead of being at uh, uh, 43 megaparsec, 430 megaparsec was 1850 megaparsec. Uh, this one is even bigger that it was uh, at 2.7 gigaparsec away. Um, and so, uh, now we started mapping the universe. Okay, so we're now at the hour point of uh, the thing. So we can keep going if you guys want to. We don't have to. Uh, we do have a couple more questions, but I did want to kind of ask really quick towards the end before we keep going with anything else. Um, so for... Any students that want to come to the University of Utah or uh, and don't want to leave the state yet, um, and for anybody who is interested in maybe pursuing gravitational wave astronomy, um, are there any collaborations currently with LIGO here at the here in Utah, and is there a future for gravitational wave research in Utah? Good <laughs> one. So there is a collaboration because now the University of Utah is uh, is part of uh, of LIGO. In fact, I, I think that you are already organizing uh, another interview with uh, Yue Zhao, who uh, works on more theoretical aspects than uh, Ricardo and myself. Also, he works on the actual data analysis, while we work more on uh, instrumental uh, aspects. And uh, there is this uh, possibility, I think Ricardo should talk about that, there is this uh, possibility of larger gravitational wave detectors to be constructed in the future. And one of the sites that are considered for this is uh, precisely in Utah, just because of the- Most, uh, most of the site candidates are in Utah because uh, you need uh, a dry lake, uh, which has uh, a, 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 a concave curvature so uh, added that to the earth uh, uh, negative curvature makes it flat and you can build an interferometer in surface. So 
10 out of 11 candidates are uh, south of Salt Lake City. So that's pretty exciting for any like new people wanting to get into research uh, that are incoming students and stuff. So it, it definitely adds a, a uh, aspect for um, people who, you know, don't want to leave the state or something or who want to come here for that. Um, so if you guys are interested in answering a couple questions, um, we do have a couple more. Uh, if you guys want to hang out a little bit longer, Ricardo? We can still be longer, yeah. Okay, so... I am at my fourth or fifth meeting today. I start being tired. But we can uh, uh, meet again another time and, uh, and uh, get into exciting results. Yeah, I think that would be great to do another one. Um, would you mind answering one more question then? Sure, sure. Okay, so this one can be, yeah, it, it might be a little bit longer than what we're thinking, but how do you know what you're looking at when you get these signals? Like, how do you, how can you tell if it's a black hole or neutron stars or a black hole and a neutron star? Um, how do you, how do you look at the data and determine that? Well, uh, let me uh, first uh, go back to this so um, so if I look at this okay this one is the signal that we detect okay and then out of that uh, there is some other view graph that I have to find but uh, out of that we have a procedure to uh, to compare that with uh, the prediction of what the signal could be given uh, uh, let's say 30 and 40 solar masses, black holes uh, that are in spiral with a certain orientation and certain position. So, um, so we start fitting here. So the end frequency here gives me the mass of a black hole. This, the length of this in spiral, the speed in which it's ramping up, it's chirping up, it tells me the mass of a small body. And uh, and then um, uh, and then uh, uh, there are uh, if there is, if there are oscillations, uh, then means that uh, they are precessing. That means that they had spins. The two stars we are spinning in different orientation. The two black holes. So by, from this shape here, this one is very short. And uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, easy to predict much out of that. But uh, if you look at this one here, you can see that these one were black holes and this one is a neutron star. This one lasts 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds in our detection band. This one lasts something like one minute. And uh, this one is something that it takes uh, half an hour to go through this event only and everything that came out of that. And I'm not going to, to answer this question today. Another time, if you are willing to, to, to make another meeting, I'll be happy to. But it's a long answer. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a long answer. Um, something I would just want to add with that, though, is uh, when we see the signals from this, if they're black holes, we often do not detect anything else but gravitational waves from those, right? Whereas if it's a neutron star event, we can potentially see some other uh, things like uh, neutrino signals and uh, you know stuff like that along with it, correct? Gamma ray bursts that we have seen. This event was associated with gamma ray burst and optical uh, uh, lumin uh, uh, emission and uh, there is an enormous synergy between optical uh, telescope and this because if you want to figure out to figure out the inside of a neutron star we have to see what comes out at the ejection we have to see the elasticity of a neutron star because the neutron star are originally spherical, but towards the end, they are rotating so far that uh, they will become oblate, and, uh, and that uh, changes the final orbits down there. And, but then once you shred, 
you throw away neutronic matter and by observing the optical uh, emission of that and the gamma rays and everything, then you can uh, actually say uh, what was the quark content of a neutron star before it was blown up uh, by shredded by the event. I mean, shredded means that 90 something percent go into a black hole, but uh, three, four, five, up to 10 percent can be ejected because the outside of the edge of the, the limbs of the of a two neutron star tries to go faster than the speed of light, they failed, of course, and they get uh, uh, kicked out in outer space. And then all of the neutron matter, which now is not held together by gravity anymore, stabilized by gravity, stuff became like hell. And, uh, and that decay is what makes the neutron, the, the, the gamma ray bursts. And, uh, and then the, what is called a kilonova like uh, uh, curve and from that you can reconstruct how the neutron star was built if you can put the two things together and um, neutrinos are tough because uh, uh, neutrinos uh, uh, are notoriously difficult to detect uh, and uh, yeah if we were to find some but uh, um, it's not a supernova which is that a neutrino rich and the neutrinos don't come out in a super fast pulse like in a supernova the neutrino will come out as uh, the neutrons decay and that takes minutes and uh, and so having them spread in time means that uh, it's essentially in and having them to be reasonably low energy uh, that makes it very difficult uh, to detect. So if we find them next time, we'll be elated to find them. But um, um, we do expect more to see and to correlate uh, if we get uh, a supernova event, then we expect to see neutrinos. But that is yet a third long talk. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think we're good for tonight. Um, if anybody listening has more questions, um, feel free to uh, leave them for next time. Even for ne leave them for next time. Um, but you're welcome to post them on our event page here, um, and we'll uh, try to add them in for next time. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, Tubdual and Ricardo for all of their time and helping us to understand gravitational waves and figure out, you know, what everything LIGO has to do about it. Not everything, but super <laughs> over the top or yeah. A but little, yeah, a little bit. A, a little bit, yeah. Uh, a glossing over of what goes on. <laughs> so uh, thank you both for your time and uh, we'll you. try to thank add you. another one for next week. So if anybody else is listening, you're welcome to join in and we'll make an event for that too. Uh, Chances are that in two weeks I may actually be with Tukdual in, uh, in, uh, in Salt Lake City. We work together quite some and uh, we, we like to be together. We actually got together because both of us like to make waves with gravity. Called, do, you guys, called, do you guys do, uh, do you do much yeah. dancing when yeah. you're here together? To no, create the no, waves. Ski, and when you ski, you make waves down the slope using gravity. When we fall yeah. in the snow. <laughs> 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 we like it we like like life here, you know? Yeah, that's great. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, and you guys have both a good night. And thank everybody thank for joining us. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. bye. Have bye. a good night. Bye.